Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. 32 days until the election. And with us very close, we've been hearing a lot about misinformation lately, the danger it poses in this very tense and heightened political climate. And I think the term misinformation, which is a perfectly fine term, doesn't quite do enough to capture what is happening with one half of the American two-party system. Outright brazen, dangerous, ludicrous lies in denial of the most obvious reality, the one you can see before you. That has become not just the primary tactic for Donald Trump and J.D. Vance's running mate, but the operating principle increasingly for the entire Republican Party across lines of faction. Just listen to this telling exchange on the economy. No, it's not. It's uh, inflation has uh, devastated our economy. It's one of the big problems we have. And on jobs, we have the, the illegals have taken more jobs than anybody else. You have uh, illegals coming in and they're taking the jobs. Just a lie. Just a lie. Donald Trump knows the economy is doing very well. He knows the, quote, illegals, undocumented, unauthorized workers haven't taken all the jobs. Inflation has cooled. Jobs are up a lot. Wages are up. The stock market is booming. He denies it. As if by repeating the lie enough times, he can just change the underlying reality itself. That's the idea here. Another one, again, just from today, a simple small one, but perfectly indicative. Trump comes out and boasts that Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, has endorsed Trump for president. Now, you'd think you can't lie about that. It's too easy to check. You could probably guess what the problem is here. Jamie Dimon has not endorsed Donald Trump for president. That's just a flat out lie. You could just call up his spokespeople, as reporters did. The spokesman said Jamie Dimon has not endorsed anyone. Now, when Trump was called out for this obvious brazen lie, he then resorted to even more lying, telling NBC News, I don't know anything about it, and somebody put it up, no, I don't know. After NBC News explained that Diamond did not endorse Trump, he responded, well, then somebody is using his name? And the original post with the lie is still up, by the way. Again, this is just a perfect example of how the Trump Republican Party operates. Today, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, a person who at once upon a time people thought was like a serious dude, he called these new jobs numbers, right, put out by independent civil servants, another fake jobs report out from the Biden-Harris government, basically accusing the White House of cooking the books. And at some level, um, it's not anything new, right? We've been living with this for so long. Everyone knows Trump and his MAGA cronies are liars. But there, there's a real danger here, right? The lies are dangerous. They have a cost. Like, for instance, most obviously, the big lie of a stolen 2020 election, the lie that Donald Trump repeats to this day, almost every day, even as his running mate tries to gaslight us all into believing he doesn't. And that lie caused the deadly January 6th insurrection, election workers to flee their homes due to threats of violence. It is the means through which Trump may be priming supporters to do it all over again a month from now. In fact, he seems dead set on that if he loses. There's also Trump's disgusting blood libel directed to Haitian migrants, racist lies about folks stealing and eating pets. That directly led to a series of bomb threats and fears for safety in Springfield, Ohio, and workplaces and in schools. And it's a lie, by the way, that J.D. Vance admits is a lie. The American media totally ignored this stuff until Donald Trump and I started talking about cat memes. If I have to, if I have to create right. stories so that the American media actually pays attention to the suffering of the American people, then that's what I'm going to do, Dan. Make stories, right? So that claim about Haitians is probably the most notable. But again, Trump's dangerous, violent lies about migrants is an everyday occurrence, right? They don't end there. Uh, uh, with graphic and violent rhetoric. We're releasing migrants into our country, but these are killers. These are people at the highest level of killing. They cut your throat, and they won't even think about it the next morning. They won't even think about it. And these people are all over the place, and they're killing people. I could go through the stories, and I won't. But all over, sometimes I do. They come up, they grab young girls, and they slice them up right in front of their parents. Now, these are dangerous things to say, and, and they are incitement of a source. And the exact same thing is happening with the lies that he's been pushing around Hurricane Helene. That FEMA disaster relief money is somehow being taken from those affected and redirected to migrants. 
So we now have no money that was supposed to be used for tragedy, for hurricanes. And this was a tragic hurricane. This was maybe the worst hurricane we've ever had. And he's got no money. And we said, what happened to all the money? They were given billions for this. He spent it on illegal migrants coming into the country, a big percentage of which are murderers. So we are poisoning our country. Our country is being poisoned. Our country is being ruined. It's being ruined by these people. And they took billions of dollars and used it for settlements of people that came in, many of which are criminals. Again, this is fabricated. It's made up. It's a lie. In fact, the only president that took FEMA money for migrant detention was Donald Trump when he was president. But it's just an alternate reality, right? This is now gospel among a certain percentage of the population. And the message is sticking. Voters are buying the alternate reality he's selling. A voter asked him about it at his rally just last hour. And again, he lied again. Congressman Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican, even got in on the conspiracy game. Listen to this one. Quote, yes, they can control the weather. It's ridiculous for anyone to lie and say it can't be done. And I have to admit, when I first saw this, I thought it was a parody or that someone had taken over her account. But no. Now, the idea here, in case you're not following this particular right wing conspiracy theory, is that uh, Hurricane Helene was created and sent to Western North Carolina to punish people that don't vote for Donald Trump, even though Asheville, a big part of it hit, is famously a liberal town in North Carolina. Now, I shouldn't be surprised, this is coming from the woman who said famously, famously, that some Rothschild-fabricated space laser was the thing that started a California wildfire. But that was before she was a member of Congress. So now she's a member of Congress, like, they control the weather out there for everyone to read is a pretty shocking lie. I mean, actually, it's out past a lie. A lie doesn't really do it justice. It's a lurid delusion. It's a form of madness she's hoping to spread. Also, who exactly is the they, you think? Think for a second. Who's the they? Yesterday, uh, one Republican state senator from North Carolina, Republican, was begging folks to stop spreading these lies and conspiracy theories about Western North Carolina, which are actually hampering recovery efforts. Please help stop this junk. It is just a distraction to people trying to do their job. Please don't let these crazy stories consume you or you have continually contact your elected officials to see if they are true. One North Carolina Democrat spoke to the HuffPost about just how polluted the information environment had become, thanks in part to Donald Trump. The biggest issue is rumors and fake memes and the photos of people being trapped in areas around the country, around the county, and we send folks out to rescue them and there's no one there to be rescued. Precious resources at the county level amidst a national disaster, going out to rescue people who are not there. These are dangerous lies in the middle of a serious natural disaster that has left over 200 people dead. And it's part of a larger attempt to, to trick and scare voters and, and, and basically to sort of whisk them into an alternate reality, right? All part of the same scheme. From J.D. Vance being unable to say that Trump lost the election, FEMA stole all the money and spent it on immigrants, Joe Biden is cooking the books, the Bureau of Label Statistics, they can control the weather? What do you even do with stuff like that? Like, where do you start com combating a lie like that? The plain fact is that there's been a complete and total epistemic breakdown among tens of millions of our fellow Americans. That breakdown, that brazen lying, is what brought threats of violence to the people of Springfield. It is right now, as I speak to you, actively hampering an ongoing hurricane recovery. And nearly four years ago, it brought an armed, angry mob to our nation's capital. And if left unabated, I fear it is going to get people hurt again. The political question is whether this Trump fatigue, which is documented and joked about, could impact turnout. It's a legitimate question where even reporters are asking Trump rally goers, why are you leaving early? The Washington Post asked several as a long rally, basically stretched their plans, and they cited different needs, like they had to go to take care of a pet, see a family member. One attendee said their phone died. Some said sound quality. Most of these sound like excuses rather than what might be the real answer. People with pets, just to take them at their word, know that they left their pet at home when they go out to a Trump rally or wherever they go. 
And if your phone died while you were listening to a, a great speech, you might just finish watching and go back and charge your phone in the car. These references I'm making are to what actual MAGA fans told this reporter were their reasons for leaving. Leaving early. If there are deeper reasons the MAGA people left that rally, where the reporter was and the other ones, maybe they don't want to share them with the media or post them online. But one thing we do know about most of the people going to a Trump rally is they are either Trump fans or Trump curious. They made an effort to go wait and see him. So if they're turning out or have some pause, well, what about all the other less Trumpified Republicans? That's a big question. It's one the Harris campaign actually thinks could be key to victory, that there is an echo between people who are interested enough in Trump to go to a rally, but react to what he actually says now, the Trump of today, not four or eight years ago, that they leave early. A link between that and why top Republicans are breaking with their party to endorse Kamala Harris. Now, this important theme in the campaign right now, which could tip states towards Harris, is this embrace that I'm telling you about, not only by the independents and conservatives, but lifelong staunch Republicans. What voters saw in Wisconsin and many others watched across the nation is so unusual in American life, you'd actually have to do a double take, especially if this happened just a few years ago. Liz Cheney began the Trump era as a leader of the entire Republican House caucus. She backed Trump in 2020. It's not that long ago, but ended that era fighting the insurrection after he lost 2020. Now she's campaigning with Harris, along with her father, Dick Cheney, as other Republicans who work directly for Trump and his whole agenda are breaking with him to back Kamala Harris. This is big. It could impact the outcome of the election. It is a rarity in our current partisan political era. And so right now, tonight, to see how major this is, consider how these partisan, Republican, staunch, conservative hawks have sounded across the bulk of their entire careers. We are all a little weary of the Clinton-Gore routine. It is time for them to go. How much damage do you think President Obama has done? I think it's been devastating. Uh, he's strengthened our enemies. All of his policies are working. It's just that we're not getting any coverage of it because right. the media doesn't want, they just don't want people to see his success. A Slate magazine described him as one of 10 conservatives that will define the conservative movement. To never relent on our principles, never relent on why we were sent to Washington, D.C. McChrystal says, are you asking about Vice President Biden? Who's that? His aide goes on to say, Biden, did you say bite me? Did you really tell Senator Leahy bleep yourself? I did. You think he's the worst president ever? Well, he's certainly the worst in my lifetime. Mm. That's just a small sampling. They sounded like that mo most of the time, over and over, about all those political issues. Now these hardline conservatives, even former members of the Trump administration who served through 2020 from its final years, look at this phalanx endorsing Kamala Harris. And the Cheneys are telling their supporters and allies that backing Kamala Harris is specifically, intentionally, and substantively bigger than politics, bigger than a party. You have to remember that because we talk so much about policies that sometimes we forget there are things that are bigger than policies, as important as they are. And they're saying this is an urgent constitutional cause. President Harris will be able to unite this nation. Liz Cheney really is a leader who puts country above party and above self. As a conservative, as a patriot, as a mother, as someone who reveres our Constitution, I am honored to join her in this urgent cause. No matter your political party, there is a place for you with us and in this campaign. A welcoming and outreach, bipartisan message there from Harris. This is out on the trail, of course. Trump's own aides have supplied some of the most damning testimony against him year after year, scandal after scandal from January 6th, where some are going back and saying that was their breaking point. Trump Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Matthews is in that camp, and we just heard her very clearly, very thoughtfully state her case against Trump and for Kamala Harris on Wednesday in a discussion with several Trump vets right here on The Beat. 
I don't agree with Kamala Harris on wow. most things. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know what we can agree on? That we respect the Constitution, that I believe she is someone who will uphold it. And Donald Trump has shown us that he won't. He is the first president in our nation's history to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. I don't want to put someone like that back in power in the Oval Office because I don't think he deserves to step foot anywhere near it. That is worth hearing. That's why we had her on to hear it. That's what Matthews took from her front row seat, which turned her into a witness to a now charged and in some cases convicted election plot and sedition. Another star witness, all the way back to Trump's first impeachment, Ambassador Sondland, also publicly said January 6th was his line, publicly breaking with Trump. But unlike what I've just been reporting for you, unlike Cheney or Matthews, as Trump got power and won the nomination, Sondland retracted. He came back to MAGA. Now, when we assembled this panel earlier this week, we deliberately invited one key witness who stayed loyal to Trump throughout, Peter Navarro, who you see there, the other now backing Harris, whom I just mentioned, Matthews, and we included Sondland as an aide who went from backing Trump to breaking with him to now backing him again. It's a lot of explaining to do, a zigzag zig, a kind of double J.D. Vance. So we asked why he made that journey and if he could logically explain it as anything other than for reasons of power. I was completely in, even with all of the foibles that everyone has already identified and I don't need to go through them again, until January 6th. It was a no for me after that. I don't stand by it, and I'll tell you why. Oh, Ambassador, me, no. this is, I'll let you finish, already, but this no, is I want so to striking. You said it was a no for me after that, I did, after I January did, 6th. I did. And here we are right now. I did. And you're saying it's a yes for you. It is a yes for me. It is an absolute yes for me. Did he always make the right decisions? No, but no one does. So, you can hear it yourself. Diverging views, even among Trump vets, turned critics about whether to even remain critics or support Harris. Now, that interview has been driving headlines this week, especially focusing on Sondland's answer and turn. These are just some of the outlets that picked it up. And it's partly, probably, because it is simply newsworthy and interesting, but also perhaps because political observers see in Sondland a pattern across the wider Republican Party. Bill Barr broke with Trump over Jan 6. He warned of all the dangers, but is now backing Trump. And many other Trump vets have much larger challenges than deciding who to endorse right now. Look at the consequences of just working for him. A higher rate than any other first-term administration of what you see on your screen. Disbarment, criminal targets, indictments, convictions. These crimes were all on behalf of Donald Trump. Many of them, as you see, charged Steve Bannon in prison right now. And broadening out, Trump's campaigns and businesses have been exposed over the years because of this same factor I'm telling you about. The actual testimony and witness statements by people who worked for him, you can see the people convicted and many others who helped lead to these convictions by saying what they saw Trump and his allies and his organizations and his enterprises do. This matters, and if it matters any time, let me tell you something. October, a month out, it matters right now. So where are we going? You say, okay, Ari, you walked through all this. What are we talking about? The whole point of principle is that it operates on a higher plane than all the other typical policy differences, or matters of style, or even what you need in any organization, any political situation, which is some compromise. Some principles cannot be compromised. Democracy has always been number one on that list of principles. I'm telling you about historical facts and constitutional law. I'm not adding any extra speculation or opinion. That is the principle. That is why from the president on down to every sworn federal official, the law requires that you take that oath. It is not to a party, let alone your personal interests. It is an oath. It is not symbolic. It is literal. You can be impeached, removed, and punished for betraying that oath. And it's not even an oath to the office, say, in Obama's case, as you see on your screen, to the presidency. It is to the constitutional democracy itself. We called our new interview special Divided Oath for that reason. We may host further installments on this before Election Day.
because democracy and these principles and going to the source to get real testimonial eyewitness information is one of the most important things this election cycle. And that's why this election is still different. For the people who know Trump best, and many of whom have the worst things to say about him, and for those who lived a life of conservative values and are now putting everything on the line in a public rarity to back Vice President Harris as an urgent patriotic cause. Those are her words, Ms. Cheney, not mine. A patriotic, urgent constitutional cause. Joining us now, allergies are killing me this season, the Washington Post senior national political correspondent and MSNBC political analyst Ashley Parker and staff writer with The Atlantic and MSNBC political contributor Mark Leibovich. Ashley, 32 days to go. We see both candidates in swing states. What do you see as the most important question each one of them has to try to answer for voters for the next month? That, that's a great question. And it's sort of what's stunning to me when you say voters is how small the group of voters they are trying to answer that question for is. Um, and those universe of persuadable voters don't exactly look quite similar, um, although they are both trying to win over um, younger voters. That's defined as under 50. Uh, and those few uh, in both campaigns more heavily male. So for someone like Vice President Harris, um, a lot of things we hear voters say about her is that they want to know more about her. Um, and in talking to a ton of experts, uh, part of that uh, they say can be sort of a latent uh, subconscious sexism or bias that female candidates are held to a different bar and different standard than their male counterparts. Um, and part of that, they say, actually, in this case, is very legitimate because nobody pays attention to vice presidents, regardless of who they are. And so she came on the scene uh, at the top of the ticket very recently. So she does need to answer, who is she? What is her plan? What is she going to do to help the lives of Americans? Um, and for Donald Trump, it's a little different. What people like and also what they deeply dislike about him is baked into the cake. Um, so some of what he has to do is less answering a question and more not reminding, again, this very small but determinative sliver of voters of everything they don't like about him. The chaos, the insult, the name-calling, yeah. um, the sort of dark dystopian vision and uh, revenge that he's promising to, to wreak on his political opponents. Um, he needs to steer clear of that as much as he needs to answer an affirmative question. You know, Peggy Noonan had an interesting article on this today, what each candidate, uh, what each voter or supporter of each candidate should be worried about. And she mentions Donald Trump and, you know, the chaos and the uh, the seemingly uh, losing his grasp on things even further, uh, the lies. Speaking of lies, let me um, play for you um, what Donald Trump said about FEMA and where the money went, where the money is yesterday. Let's listen. We had the best four years with hurricanes. We got, we, we took care of people. Now we have a horrific disaster in North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, Tennessee, Florida, and Virginia. That's how big this hurricane was. And the Harris-Biden administration says they don't have any money. They've spent it all on, they spent all of their money. They have almost no money because they spent it all on illegal migrants. They stole the FEMA money just like they stole it from a bank so they could give it to their illegal immigrants that they want to have vote for them this season. We had the best four years with hurricanes. What a, what a strange thing to say. Also, I think you would uh, ask the people of Puerto Rico how they did with a hurricane um, when Donald Trump was in office and that recovery effort. Um, that, that being beside the point, this idea this lie, Mark, that FEMA doesn't have any money. The, the administration has said this is not true. There's no, no evidence to suggest it's true. Where does he get this stuff from? Oh, I mean, he just makes it up. I mean, it's lies. I mean, you, you called it out. I mean, I think what, what's interesting about this is not to sort of, I mean, you, you know, obviously lies like this, which are so egregious, you know, need to be um, called out. But I think the larger point is, 
he's walking into the middle of, you know, one of the most affected states in a catastrophic natural disaster. And he is basically, per, you know, perpetrating the message that this is terrible. The federal government, is, I mean, he's, he's undermining this relief effort in every way, shape or form. I mean, you can tell, by the way, Kemp has himself talked about this in the past, in the last few days. Uh, Tom Tillis, the senator from North Carolina. I mean, this is not making anyone's job on the ground easier. It's not making the political situation certainly uh, look functional at all. And I think in some ways, Ashley mentioned sort of the latent message here. I mean, this is a reminder of a chaos agent going right into the middle of an inherently chaotic situation, which is a natural disaster of this magnitude. And that is the exhaustion that that Donald Trump, I think, could that that could be his biggest um, his biggest obstacle here. I mean, just the weariness of what this looks like when leadership of some kind is needed. And and frankly, look, I mean, most people don't have immediate recall or immediate knowledge of what is a lie and what is true. I mean, they're going to look at a person of authority like Donald Trump, and they're going to be inclined, I think, in many cases to believe it. I mean, so that's unfortunate on a lot of levels, but it's how he operates and it's not a new story. Yeah, and, and maybe they won't go to a news source to try to figure out if it is true. They won't bother to do that. Um, speaking of Peggy Noonan, she also has a, an assessment of Harris, and I think this one is interesting. Um, she says, uh, Harris still hasn't given voters a satisfying sense of what she is about, what the purpose of her political career is. She hasn't fleshed out her political intent, what she stands for, what she won't abide, what she means to establish, and what she won't let happen. What is her essential mission? Is it national repair? Is it to stabilize an uncertain country? Is it relaunch? Is it more from the top for the bottom, period? Is it America as defender of democracy in the world? Is it about focusing now first and until something works on the high daily cost of living? When things can't be reduced to their essentials, it's because they're not real. There's nothing to reduce. She so far hasn't conveyed a sense of intellectual grasp. It's harsh from Peggy Noonan, certainly. Do you agree with this? Do you think that people do understand why she wants to be in office and what her, her goals are, Mark? I mean, I think, I mean, first of all, that, that's a lot of questions for, for one candidate to answer. I don't know where you begin. I mean, look, she's had a very short campaign. Um, I think what she's trying to do is define herself in the broad brushes of who she is, where she is on big issues like uh, reproductive rights, the economy, the environment, um, democracy, that kind of thing. I, I think the, the broadest of brushes is that she's an alternative to Donald Trump. And what she has done over the last two, three months is try to make herself acceptable. She has redefined herself. She has reintroduced herself to some degree and I think has been effective if you look at, you know, between the convention, between uh, the debate performance, uh, between the picking of Tim Walls and, and a number of other things. But I think really the last six weeks of this campaign or five weeks of the campaign is where, I mean, ultimately that that kind of journey is going to be defined one way or the other. I did not get to abortion like I wanted to. Um, so everybody go out there, go to Washington Post, go to Republican Sweep from abortion restrictions and final weeks of campaign. That is Ashley Parker's later p latest piece on that subject. We're going to have a little bit more later on um, something that happened out of California with the attorney general on on the 32 days to go before Election Day in America. And this is with the vast and growing coalition of patriots throwing their formidable political weight behind Vice President Kamala Harris. Looks and sounds like today. I am a Ronald Reagan conservative. I tell you, I have never voted for a Democrat. But this year, I am proudly casting my vote for Vice President Kamala Harris. In this election, a broad coalition has come together to support Vice President Kamala Harris. Now, we may disagree on some things, but we are bound together by the one thing that matters to us as Americans more than any other, and that's our duty to our Constitution and our belief in the miracle and the blessing of this incredible nation. I ask you to meet this moment. I ask you to stand in truth, to reject the depraved cruelty of Donald Trump. And I ask you instead to help us elect Kamala Harris for president. That's former Congresswoman Liz Cheney in Ripon, Wisconsin. It is the birthplace of the Republican Party. She's making the case for why she, a lifelong conservative, the daughter of arguably 
the most conservative public figure in modern American political history, will cast her vote for Vice President Kamala Harris, arguing that her fellow card-carrying Republicans and other lifelong conservatives should do the same. A very public, a very prominent permission structure 32 days out from the election that could very well tip the scales in November. What Liz Cheney did with that speech, again, in the birthplace of the Republican Party in Wisconsin, one of a handful of states that could decide the election result, is to unleash a blistering argument as to why any Republican, any conservative, any patriot cannot and must not cast a vote for Donald Trump. In this election, putting patriotism ahead of partisanship is not an aspiration. It is our duty. Donald Trump was willing to sacrifice our capital to allow law enforcement officers to be beaten and brutalized in his name and to violate the law and the Constitution in order to seize power for himself. I don't care if you are a Democrat or a Republican or an independent. That is depravity, and we must never become numb to it. What January 6th shows us is that there is not an ounce, not an ounce of compassion in Donald Trump. He is petty, he is vindictive, and he is cruel. And Donald Trump is not fit to lead this good and great nation. Wow. Unfit, petty, vindictive, cruel. Liz Cheney called out Donald Trump's depravity and called it what it is, disqualifying. And now after marshalling the political star power of one of the Republican Party's biggest figures, Vice President Kamala Harris and Governor Tim Walz are deploying someone who is unrivaled in the Democratic Party's political arsenal, Barack Obama. The people who will decide this election are asking a very simple question. Who will fight for me? Who's thinking about my future, about my children's future, about our future together? One thing is for certain, Donald Trump is not losing sleep over that question. We do not need four more years of bluster and bumbling and chaos. We have seen that movie before, and we all know that the sequel is usually worse. Today it was announced that former President Barack Obama will hit the campaign trail for Vice President Harris and Governor Walls across battleground states, beginning with a campaign stop next Thursday in Pittsburgh. As the New York Times put it, President Obama is, quote, joining the final push to deliver Vice President Harris a victory, starting with perhaps the most consequential battleground state of the election, Pennsylvania, and adding to his singular star power to a coalition alongside patriots of every political stripe, the likes of which the country has never witnessed in the context of a political campaign. We should say Vice President Harris is in Michigan today. Earlier, she spoke to a labor union in Detroit. A short time from now, Vice President Harris will deliver a campaign speech in Flint, Michigan, where she will be joined by basketball legend and Michigan native Magic Johnson. Another spoke in the ever-broadening and growing Harris Walls Coalition. It's where we start today with my colleague NBC's Yumi Shell Cinder in Flint, Michigan, ahead of the vice president's rally there tonight. Also joining us, former Republican congressman and MSNBC political analyst David Jolly Sear. And with me at the table, the Reverend Al Sharpton, host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network. Yumisha, I know it's loud where you are, um, always uh, giving you the chance to have to multitask and, and pay attention to us while events start to unfold behind you. So we thank you in advance. Um, it isn't just sort of editorially fascinating that Liz Cheney is now on the campaign trail for the vice president. It is politically imperative, right, that the Harris campaign assemble this coalition that is incredibly electric to all the vibrant and vital parts of the Democratic base, that they all turn out and feel excited, but that she also brings over independent and Republican women and men. And they, they, they seem to be very comfortable 
um, campaigning alongside Liz Cheney, which is remarkable in and of itself. It is remarkable um, when you look at sort of all of the different things that the Harris campaign is trying to build together to to try to win this race, which is, of course, poll show incredibly close. Now, for me, I just think of the last two days. I was just in Wisconsin watching Liz Cheney come out to, to, to chance of thank you, Liz, by a large group of people in Wisconsin. And then today, just a little bit off camera here, there's Magic Johnson talking to reporters, of course, a native of Detroit, trying to bring in those voters that might be undecided and who recognize him as, as, as someone that they respect and whose star power brought a lot of, uh, of real joy to Detroit. It's interesting because the Harris campaign is trying to build this coalition. And I've been talking to a number of people, including Cedric Richmond, who's a co-chair of the campaign. And he told me that really they're trying to lean in uh, to really aggressively attack Donald Trump because their internal pollings and their data shows that there are a lot of persuadable voters who want to both hear from people like Liz Cheney talking about why people should put country over party, but also because some of those voters want her to define herself in Vice President Harris. They want her to explain what a Harris administration would do, and they also want her to, in some ways, really explain again why she sees Donald Trump as unqualified to be president, which is why we're going to see more and more ads talking about sort of how he might raise the retirement age going after seniors, or how he might mass deport people who are helping revitalize places like Springfield, Ohio. So the Harris campaign is definitely trying to build what is going to be this big coalition. And there's a big, big tent here that she's trying to do. And she's hoping that a lot of these people who show up, um, that they're going to be moved to do that and moved to go to the polls, Nicole. It is such a nerve-wracking period in any campaign. But I want to focus on what you're talking about, the case against Donald Trump. Here is, um, again, extraordinary that these messages, the same message coming from, um, you know, arguably the biggest star in the Democratic Party and a name synonymous for generations with the Republican Party. Um, here's Liz Cheney and President Obama. The other day I heard someone compare Trump to the neighbor who keeps running his leaf blower outside your window every minute of every day. Now, from a neighbor, that's exhausting. From a president, it's just dangerous. I cast my first vote ever in 1984 for Ronald Reagan. In other words, I was a Republican even before Donald Trump started spray tanning. Yamish, I, I picked those out because I think they show not just the power that each uh, that Liz Cheney and President Obama have in their own circles of influence, but the special sauce that they have, the ability to poke Donald Trump in a way that Donald Trump is incapable of not responding. They can goad him. They can um, send him off message. They can send him spiraling into days of angry all caps posts on his own social media platform. And at a time in the campaign season where every day, every news cycle counts, that is an added benefit to their star power. It's an added benefit in the eyes of Harris campaign aides that I've been talking to. And it's also sort of echoing what Vice President Harris tried to do and what she, her campaign believes she successfully did during the debate, which is needle Donald Trump. Remember, she called him boring and said that he was fired by millions and millions of Americans. It was that kind of messaging that they felt like really made her shine during the debate and made former President Donald Trump not want to do a second debate, which is what Vice President Harris is saying she wants to do. So she's going to see, you're going to hear more of that sort of leaning into humor, leaning into joy. Um, but you're also, again, going to be really trying to draw the, the Harris campaign a really sharp contrast to former President Donald Trump, because they do believe that undecided voters will also be moved by that. Um, the other thing that I've been hearing from folks is that they want to see Michelle Obama, for, former First Lady Michelle Obama, out on the campaign trail. We're not sure where she's going to be, but I remember as soon soon as the vice president became the top of the ticket, someone told me, we hope that, that they park Michelle Obama in a place like North Carolina 
or Georgia and just have her talk to people over and over again. So there is some hope in the Democratic Party that you also see the other Obama, who some people say even delivered even better speech at the DNC, talking about the idea that that, that former President Trump was maybe going after black jobs, going after that sort of meme and that, that moment where a lot of African Americans and a lot of people around the country were, were laughing at Donald Trump for saying that immigrants were taking quote unquote black jobs, meaning possibly menial jobs, but it became a sort of running joke among a lot of African Americans. So you could also see someone like that because this is feeling like an all hands on deck election because the polls are so close and because even in the last few days we saw the firefighters union choose not to endorse Vice President Harris or former President Donald Trump, which is seen as a blow to Harris because they were one of the first unions to back President Biden. First, I want to show you this, Bruce Springsteen. He announced his endorsement of Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz in a video that was posted on Instagram yesterday. It really was, it really was perfect. And I'm just talking about the words delivered, the location, how he was dressed. I mean, it looked like Spielberg <laughs> put this together. The, 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 the perfect on every front, uh, and uh, it's, it's actually... So pretty good, uh, pretty good tip for anybody running for politics in the future, uh, in the age of Instagram, the age of TikTok, uh, the age of, well, insane madness. Here's Bruce Springsteen sounding very sane. Hi, I'm Bruce Springsteen. Friends, fans, and the press have asked me who I'm supporting in this most important of elections. And with full knowledge of my opinions, no more or less important than those of any of my fellow citizens, here's my answer. I'm supporting Kamala Harris for president and Tim Waltz for vice president and opposing Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. Here's why. We are shortly coming upon one of the most consequential elections in our nation's history. Perhaps not since the Civil War has this great country felt as politically, spiritually, and emotionally divided as it does than at this moment. It doesn't have to be this way. The common values, the shared stories that make us a great and united nation are waiting to be rediscovered and retold once again. Now that will take time, hard work, intelligence, faith, and women and men with the national good guiding their hearts. America's the most powerful nation on earth, not just because of her overwhelming military strength or economic power, but because of what she stands for, what she means, what she believes in. Freedom, social justice, equal opportunity, the right to be in love who you want. These are the things that make America great. Donald Trump is the most dangerous candidate for president in my lifetime. His disdain for the sanctity of our Constitution, the sanctity of democracy, the sanctity of the rule of law, and the sanctity of the peaceful transfer of power should disqualify him from the office of president ever again. He doesn't understand the meaning of this country its history or what it means to be deeply American. On the other hand, Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz are committed to a vision of this country that respects and includes everyone, regardless of class, religion, race, your political point of view, or sexual identity. And they want to grow our economy in a way that benefits all, not just the few like me on top. That's the vision of America I've been consistently writing about for 55 years. Now, everybody sees things different, and I respect your choice as a fellow citizen. But like you, I've only got one vote, and it's one of the most precious possessions that I have. That's why, come November 5th, I'll be casting my vote for Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz. Thanks for listening. You know, Gene, um, there, there's so many things that were done right uh, there, uh, stylistically, uh, mm -hmm. but, but the words, it doesn't, he talks about how we're more divided now than any time since the Civil War. It says, it doesn't have to be this way. The common values, yeah. the shared stories that make us great, and a, a united nation, uh, or, you know, um, the, a united nation, are waiting to be rediscovered and retold once again. And then he says of Donald Trump, he doesn't understand 
uh, the meaning of this country, its history, and what makes America great. And then at the end, I love how he says to his fans and anybody else watching, hey, listen, just one guy's opinion. Uh, I know people think differently, but this is the most precious thing I have, my vote. And that's why I'm telling you it's so important not only to vote for Kamala Harris, but to beat Donald Trump. What are your thoughts? Well, look, he really does have a way with words, doesn't he? He has for a while. I just saw Bruce um, uh, and, and the E Street Band perform here in Washington a few weeks ago. My friend Stevie Van Zandt, and every, they were just in terrific form, and it, it, it was such a cross-section. It's, uh, it, it, it is a display of, of Americana uh, up there on, on the stage that, that speaks to so many people um, uh, through the music and, and especially through the lyrics that are, that are just piercing. He's, a, he's just a, he's, he's amazing. And I thought that was a great endorsement. It really was. It was, um, it was pure Bruce Springsteen and... Um, uh, I hope people watch it. Now, you know, Donnie, with Mika off the show this morning, I can say what you are. You are an advertising and branding <laughs> legend. Uh, she wouldn't, like, tell me to be quiet and stop making your head bigger than it is. But yeah. let's just, uh, TJ, roll this uh, while Donnie talks, just so we can look at the, the visuals of it. Talk us through that, Donnie. Why, why does that, the second it hits the screen, why does that appeal to Americans so much? Well, it appeals to Americans for two reasons. Number one, it's Bruce Springsteen. Number, but number two, that is a seat that pretty much anybody in this country can relate to sitting in. That, that, is, a, that is in a diner. That is in a uh, every, you know, we all know that diner. And he's wearing the flannel shirt. And he's, uh, there's something about Springsteen that uh, transcends every other celebrity. By the way, that flannel shirt, <clears throat> talk about the consistency. It works because it's he's consistent authentic. with who he's we authentic. know he is. Well, the whole thing is authentic. And, the, you know, the whole thing is, and there is, I've been very outspoken, not very outspoken. I've said many times, you know, step away from celebrities, Democrats. You know, it's, it just puts you in the elitist category. Bruce is in a different place than everybody else. He is not red. He is not blue. He is America. He is red, white, and blue. And there's a trust factor there, and there's an honesty there, and there's an authenticity there. And he's the boss. And I think this is beautifully done. It's well crafted. It's well written. But Joe, you said it best. It's authentic, and that's what makes it. You know, Mara, there's also a challenge in there, which is this is what I've been writing about in my songs for 50 years. And it's I, almost his way of saying, okay. You say you love my songs. Mm -hmm. You say you love my lyrics. You say, like, you're a, a super fan of mine. Okay, well, what you've been singing to, the songs yeah. that you've been singing to are exactly what I'm talking about now over these two and a half minutes. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up because, first of all, I wish my father was here, who also was a lifelong advertising executive. He was the creative director at Ogilvy & Mather. No way. I started out at Ogilvy & Mather. So you guys could have quite a he, conversation. He was the guy that fired you. Yeah, I was uh, about to tell you to stop wearing the Baby Gap no. t-shirts to work. No, no. He went on to own his own company, wow. too. And, and he um, has a long history in the business. But I love watching um, campaign spots with him because he has such a similar take. And I think what he would say, too, is the other reason it works is that it respects the audience. Yeah. It's not talking down to the viewer. It's saying, you're one of me, you're one of us, I'm here at this table with you. Sit at my table, and I'm going to treat you like an adult. And then I'm, I'm saying, please do the right thing. You can. It's up to you, but here's why I believe so strongly in this. Come sit with me. And it's powerful. It's also really important because this is a moment where the campaign desperately needs right. more male surrogates. It needs That's more trusted male surrogates to get this message out. And I think that's why Walls has gotten so under Donald Trump's skin, because he's right. an example of a man who can be strong without diminishing others and right. without controlling others. And so the more examples we see of that and legends like Bruce Springsteen are directly in that tradition, the better, not just for Kamala Harris, but for the country. I mean, ultimately this is about between Liz Cheney and Bruce Springsteen saying, you know, this is America. 
Right. Those guys over there who want to take away your rights, destroy this country right. for themselves and their pals, that's not America. No. This is this is us. Well, you, you also bring up a great point about where the Harris campaign is right now. And we knew this was going to be the case beforehand. I think we talked about it around the table that when you substitute Joe Biden for Kamala Harris, you're going to be substituting a candidate who actually overperforms uh, among uh, for Democrats, among older white guys in Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania, but underperforms among people of color and younger voters. So that's been switched since Kamala Harris has come on board. And now it is the older white guys in Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania that that uh, the Harris campaign needs to pick up along with Hispanics. She she needs to gain in that. And, and yeah. this is a message to those guys uh, in in a, again, in a diner, as Donnie said, that every one of those guys and all of us right. understand it is it is uh, yeah an important message to those voters yeah i mean also i think a lot of them are primed already to go into that voting booth and say i cannot do four more years of donald trump right i love my wife i love my daughter i love my country i don't really believe in this but they do need that permission structure i've been yeah. traveling for the times all year talking right. to the, some of these voters and a lot of them feel like they are alone in this well what what does it even matter if i vote all the guys I know might be voting for Trump. Right. But this says, no, come on in. Come the water's on. fine. It is It is so important. You are so right. Um, because right now that is the concern. Uh, 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 guys that may have voted for Trump in 16, barely were able to vote for him in 20. And they, they've said it to me. They hate the fact that they're going to have to vote for this guy in 2024. They don't feel right now. Some of them don't feel like they can vote for a Democrat, let alone Kamala Harris. And this is that's why Bruce Springsteen here. Not that one rock star is going to make a difference, but it certainly is uh, the, the the kind of phrase of, of of the campaign. It's the permission structure. Hey, wait a yeah. second. I've listened to this guy for 50 years. I know him. He's a good guy. Uh, and he shares my values. And if he says she's OK, yeah, maybe when they walk into the booth, they go, yeah, OK, let's do it.